Jó napot kívánok! Ez a Pont EU, a Pannon Televízió hetente jelentkező magazin műsora az Európai Uniós hétköznapokról. Szabadkán ebben a teremben ülésezik a Városi Képviselőtestület. Itt szavaznak a képviselők, és itt születnek meg fontos döntések. Az Európai Unióban is hasonló a helyzet. Igaz, ott sokkal több képviselő van. Az általuk meghozott döntések pedig jóval több ember életét befolyásolják. A mai Ponteuban megmutatjuk, hogy működik az Európai Parlament. A hemiciklus görög eredetű szó félkört vagy patkót jelent. Ez az úgynevezett patkó az Európai Unió parlamentjének a szíve. Most megmutatjuk, hogy hogyan épül fel. Hemiciklus. Mi is ez? A szó ókori görög eredetű, jelentése félkör. Az ókori időktől kezdve a félkör a félkör alakú fórumra utalt. Benne lépcsőzetes ülősorok voltak a felszólalók és a hallgatóság számára. Mi köze van ennek az EU-hoz? Számos európai országban ez a szó jelenti a parlamentet. Az EU-nak is megvan a maga félköre. Ezen a helyen gyűlik össze az összes 754 Európa parlamenti képviselő. Néha Brüsszelben. És egyszer egy hónapban Strasbourgban. Hogyan működik? A félkörben a képviselők politikai irányultság szerint foglalnak helyet, nem állampolgárság szerint. A politikai csoportok vezetői ülnek elől, ők vezetik kollégáikat. És a félkör közepén a parlament elnöke vezeti a vitákat és felügyeli a szavazásokat. Mire jó? A félkörben a képviselők megvitatják a mindannyiunkat érintő kérdéseket, például a mezőgazdaság, telekommunikáció és szállítás területén. És szavaznak az európai törvényekről. Az önországában is tízből hét törvényt elsőnek ebben a félkörben fogadtak el. Hogyan alakulnak ki az Európai Parlament frakciói? Mi alapján dől el, hogy ki melyik frakciónak a tagja, és mi a helyzet a független képviselőkkel. Most mindent elmagyarázunk. How do the political groups in Parliament actually work? To find out, I'll play the role of a newly elected MEP. So it's off to Parliament. Amongst those who voted for me to be here today, most choose my party rather than me personally. And there are more than a hundred parties like mine in the Parliament. Welcome to one of the two European Parliament hemicycles. All MEPs can meet together here. But if a hundred parties had to negotiate EU issues separately, chaos would soon break out. Therefore, to make discussions in the Parliament more efficient, several transnational political groups have formed before the first plenary session, because once in the hemicycle, MEPs are seated in their groups. But how am I going to go about choosing my new family? I'm not going to choose on the basis of my nationality, but rather according to political affinity. If my values were generally socialist, I would be seated here. If they were liberal, I would be seated in this area. But they could also be conservative or green amongst others. And here, at the far right end of the hemicycle, is where the non-attached members sit. These are the MEPs who are not affiliated to any political group. For a group to be formed, they must have at least 25 members from at least a quarter of EU member states. That's seven countries. There are many advantages of forming a political group. A group has a right to a secretariat and to choose its own members rather than depending on EP staff. They have the right to an extra budget for staff and for their political activities. In 2014, for example, the total budget divided between the various groups totaled almost 60 million euros. So now a change of scenery. The groups show their political weight well before the plenary session. In rooms such as this one here, the groups debate the reports, which will be voted on in the following plenary session, discussing amendments they want to put forward and their common position. 
But remember, no MEP is obliged to vote in a specific way. In general, uh, the groups at the center of the political spectrum are more uh, cohesive. Uh, you take the Greens, for example, they have been the most cohesive in the past term, uh, having a rate of about 96 percent. The EPP is also about uh, the same level at uh, 94 percent, the same for the Socialists, a little bit lower for the Aldi group. Uh, but then if you take uh, the, the groups at the, the extremes, the far left is uh, least uh, co cohesive, and then uh, the, the EFD uh, doesn't even uh, function ideologically-wise as a group. Uh, the, the MMEPs in the EFD group have voted um, united 50% uh, of the time, and the rest of the time they have voted against each other because they have uh, very uh, different uh, opinions. It's also here that MEPs decide upon the candidates they will put forward for key posts, such as the President of the Parliament, Vice Presidents, Presidents of the Parliamentary Committees and the Parliamentary Advisers. Final negotiations on the distribution of roles and the makeup of Parliamentary Committees and Delegations is then determined by the President of the Parliament and the Group Presidents. This is known as the Conference of Presidents and it takes place about twice a month. And last but not least are the political group's powers, setting the parliament's agenda, another responsibility of the Conference of Presidents. Each of the established groups therefore has a say in these vital decisions. Az Európai Unióban a plenáris üléseket Strasbourgban tartják. Most azt láthatják, hogy hogyan zajlik ott a munka és hogyan szavaznak a képviselők. Whether you get here by car, train or plane, every month and sometimes even twice a month, the entire parliament decamps from Brussels to Strasbourg for 12 four-day plenary sessions a year. That's one president, some 5,000 MEPs, staff and officials, as well as truckloads of documents. So what's it all about? Time to take a closer look. It's a tailor to cities enshrined into EU law. Historically, Parliament's formal seat is here in Strasbourg. But a second seat was built in Brussels, so that Parliament, with its increasing powers, could be closer to both the Commission and the Council. Brussels is where all the day-to-day -day groundwork and votes in committee to get proposals up and running takes place. And one of the things decided in Brussels is the agenda of the plenary. And that happens here behind these closed doors at the Conference of Presidents. It consists of President Schultz, the chairman of the seven political groups of the parliament and a member of the non-attached members, is allowed to sit in the meeting but doesn't get a vote. With the agenda decided, it's over to Strasbourg. The plenary session is anything but a walk in the park. The agenda is packed with visits of heads of state, discussing breaking news stories and where the award ceremonies for the Lux and Sakharov Prize take place. But its main function is to serve as the arena for the big decisions, to adopt, delay or kill off legislation. And that all starts here, in the hemicycle, with long hours spent debating. On the agenda will be four or five dossiers expected to face a vote the next day, and so MEPs, along with representatives from the Commission and Council, discuss and present their final positions. This is also where political groups can table last-minute amendments to a draft proposal. MEPs have a lot of speaking times during debates, and sometimes if they run over, well... Israel has signed, but not signed. Excuse me, your time is over, Herr Brock, please. And exchanges can become quite heated. I'm certainly not going to lose much sleep over this. Over to the next day when those same dossiers are put to a full plenary vote. So, Claude, can you take us through the whole process? It's a bit of a marathon, isn't it? On the list will be, for example, legislative votes, that's mm -hmm. actual lawmaking, but there are many other votes mixed in with resolutions scattered around the chamber will be whips. They usually sit down the front right. and they will indicate a thumbs up or a thumbs down. When they do a thumbs down, the arms usually go like this in a parallel fashion because if they go straight up like this, mm -hmm. sometimes you mistake it for like this. And don't forget, the parliament is open to the public and as you can see, there's lots of people everywhere. So absolutely anyone can watch all the shenanigans going on in the hemicycle, even lobbyists, so long as they all play by house rules. Lobbying kills. Is it normal that depuis 8h30 nous soyons filmés par des lobbyists dans la tribune? With the plenary over, it's now time to leave Strasbourg. But don't forget, there are also many plenaries back in Brussels. But that's another story.
Ha már a szavazásnál tartunk, akkor nézzük meg, hogyan is zajlik ez pontosan. Nem olyan egyszerű, mint gondolnák. Az Európai Unióban az erőltetett tempó miatt gyakran az is előfordul, hogy egy képviselő rosszul szavaz. Most azt tudhatják meg, hogy mi a helyzet tévedések esetén. Hello! Az Európai Parlament kulisszái mögött vagyunk. A parlament minden uniós polgárt képvisel. A 754 EP tag olyan törvényekre szavaz, melyek mindannyiunkat érintenek. De hogyan szavaznak? És a kényes témákban ki mire szavaz? Ez nem hétpecsétes titok. Jogod van tudni, hogy az EP tagok hogyan szavaznak a te érdekedben. Mindez itt történik a félkör alakú teremben. Havonta egyszer. Menjünk, nézzük meg, hogyan működik. Itt van Emily Turunen. Megkérdezem a szavazásról. Hello, Emily. Hello, Blink. Hogy vagy? Jó, és te? Köszönöm jól. Szóval, hogyan történik a szavazás? Elmagyaráznád, mielőtt még elkezdődne? A soros elnök vezeti. Átvesszük a különböző szavazásokat. Van előttünk egy lista a szavazásokról, mert lehetetlen fejben tartani azt a 100 vagy 150 szavazást, amit egy ülés alatt lebonyolítunk. Egyszerűen így működik. Felemeled a kezed. Az elnök megkérdezi, hogy ki van mellette. És mindenki, aki mellette van, felemeli a kezét. Ki van ellene? Akik ellene vannak, felemelik a kezüket. És végül a tartózkodó. Tehát ennyi a készfeltartás. De néha, ha egy tag vagy csoport név szerinti szavazást kér, akkor a szavazókártyánkkal kell szavaznunk. Megmutatom neked. Ez az igen, nem, tartózkodás. Nem nagyon bonyolult, könnyen meg lehet tanulni. Szóval alapvetően készfeltartással szavaznak. Megszámolom. 1, 10, 237, 238, 239. Túl késő. De szavazhatnak elektromos eszközök használatával is, hogy az eredmény tökéletesen áttekinthető legyen. Vagy hogy nyilván tartsák az EP tagok nevét és szavazatát. Ezt név szerinti szavazásnak hívják. Az eszközökről minden adat a központi számítógépbe kerül, ahol egy szavazócsapat feldolgozza és megjeleníti az eredményeket. Menjünk, találkozzunk a szavazatszámlálókkal. Hello! Hello Blink! Üdvözlünk az előterjesztése asztalnál. Szóval hogyan ellenőrzitek, hogy ki mire szavazott? Nem lehet egyszerű 754 felemelt kezet megszámolni. Igen, ha készfeltartásos a szavazás, az nem mindig egyszerű. Szerencsére az elnökünk és az alelnökök nagyon tapasztaltak. Könnyen meg tudják becsülni egy szavazás eredményét. De ha kétségeink vannak, vagy egy EP tag azt kéri, akkor elektronikus ellenőrzést folytatunk. Ezután a megszámolt eredmény megjelenik a képernyőkön. És mennyire vagytok gyorsak? Úgy értem, mennyi szavazást tudtok megtartani egy óra alatt? Kapaszkodj meg, akár 300 óránként. Na hát, ez igazán gyors, megmutatom. Az EP tagok jól teszik, ha a szavazási listájukra hagyatkoznak. De ha bárkit megzavarnak, például engem, még felveheti a fonalat. Csak a politikai csoportjának vezetőjére kell néznie. Hüvelykúj felfelé mellette, hüvelykúj lefelé ellene. Lapos tenyér, tartózkodás, amikor nem akar sem mellette, sem ellene lenni. De ilyen sebességnél néhány EP tag elrontatja. Mi történik ilyenkor? Ha az EP tagok észreveszik, hogy hibáztak, kérhetik, hogy a szavazat jegyzőkönyvé a javítás megjelenjen. De az elnök által kihirdetett szavazati eredmény nem fog megváltozni. Az elektronikus szavazás eredményeit először az elnök látja. Ezután nagyon hamar megjelennek a nagy képernyőkön is. Látható a mellette és ellene szóló szavazatok száma és a tartózkodások. Ha nagyon szoros, akár egyetlen szavazat is megváltoztathatja az eredményt. Tehát az EP tagok jobban teszik, ha nem hibáznak. Kíváncsi vagyok, Emilyvel megtörtént-e már? Hú, a két évem alatt kétszer történt ilyen. Szerencsére nem volt különösebb következménye, mert nagy többséggel bíró ügyekben történt. Szóval nem én voltam a kulcsfontosságú személy, szerencsére. A szavazatok kimenetelét összegyűjtik egy hivatalos dokumentumban. Ezután azok elérhetővé válnak a polgárok számára az Európai Parlament honlapján. Így megnézhetjük, hogy ki mire szavazott. Viszlát! Miután megismertük az Európai Parlamentet, jöjjön egy összehasonlítás. Most azt láthatják, hogy miben különbözik az USA és az Európai Unió törvényhozó testülete.
Every time presidential elections take place in the United States, the spotlight falls on how the American legislative system works. So let's take a closer look at it and compare it with Europe's much younger legislature. Congress goes back to the mid-1770s and the Revolutionary War against British colonial rule. Back then it was called the Second Continental Congress. One of its first achievements? To declare the 13 American colonies independent. The birth of the United States of America. The European Parliament rose from the ashes of World War II in 1951, to be precise, as the common assembly of the European Coal and Steel Community, the forerunner of the EU. Its membership then, national parliament members from France, Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands, Luxembourg and Italy. Today, Congress comprises two chambers, the House of Representatives, 435 seats, and the Senate, 100. Both are split between Republicans and Democrats, with a few independents in the larger house. The European Parliament, by contrast, currently has eight main groups from the EU's member states, reflecting all political shades. Europe's centre-right Christian Democrats are the largest, followed by the centre-left Social Democrats, then centre-right Conservatives. There are also just over 50 non-attached members sitting outside the main groups and mostly from the far right. As for powers, things are very different across the pond. Congress sets the federal budget and tax collection, foreign policy, senior appointments, and it can impeach the president, vice president, and all civil officers of the United States. The European Parliament shares its powers with the EU member states, the Council. It co-decides and can block the EU's annual budget. It recommends on the EU's position on international treaties, such as the EU-US Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, currently under negotiation. And if it's not happy with the outcome, it can block the treaty completely. It did this in 2012 with ACTA, the International Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement. Parliament also elects the Commission President and approves the College of Commissioners. And if later it's not happy with their performance, it can censure the entire Commission. However, Parliament can't initiate legislation or raise taxes. On foreign relations, it debates and forwards recommendations. The European Parliament reflects the cultural diversity of Europe in all manner of ways, but primarily through language, making its meetings and documentation available in all the EU's 24 official languages. In Washington, it's one official language. And may God bless the United States of America. Maradunk a témánál, vagyis az amerikai és az európai törvényhozás összehasonlításánál. A következő riportunk Washingtonba kalauzol minket, ahol láthatják, hogy hogyan dolgozik együtt az USA és az Európai Unió. Much is said about the special relationship between the United States and Europe, the transatlantic partnership to beat all others. The legislators of both sides are a crucial part of the equation. The European Parliament here, the two houses of Congress in Washington. Reporters skims across the pond to compare and contrast. Two politicians walk us through some of the complexities with the aid of an American historian. Eric Paulson, Republican from Minnesota, a congressman for seven years. Bernd Lange, socialist and Democrats from Germany, who first became an MEP in 1994, and historian Vincent Morelli from the Congressional Research Service. I wouldn't say there were significant power, power differences between the two. They're all, both are unique institutions with their own we, uh, strengths and weaknesses. But subtle differences separate what each legislature can actually do and initiate. Congress rose out of the ashes of the War of Independence in the 1770s. Today it is two chambers, the House of Representatives, 435 members, and the Senate, 100 members. Both are dominated by the Republican Party, making it problematic for the Democrat President Barack Obama to push through legislation. The European Parliament is a single chamber that rose from the ashes of World War II. It has seven main political groups from the EU's 28 member states. It's dominated by the centre-right and the centre-left. The shakedown in powers is like this. Congress, the federal budget, foreign policy, tax collection, senior appointments and the removal of the president by impeachment. 
The European Parliament has co-decision and blocking powers over the budget, election of the Commission and some supervisory powers. It can't initiate legislation or raise taxes. On foreign relations, it can only advise. Every member of Congress on any given day can introduce a piece of legislation, whereas in the Parliament you wait for the Commission for the big pieces of legislation. An interesting case study is TTIP. The Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership being negotiated by the European Commission and the US. Parliament is not directly involved in the negotiations. Nonetheless, today finds the head of its International Trade Committee, Bernd Lange, in Washington for talks. Now we are going to the Hill and uh, we'll meet some Congress uh, men and give them also a clear signal that we expect uh, a more ambitious position from the US side. And this advice to EU negotiators? Take our points on board, otherwise it would be problematic to get an agreement through the parliament. The times where trade agreements were negotiated behind closed doors are over. On to Capitol Hill and a meeting with Eric Paulson, a Republican representative deeply involved in TTIP and very aware of the machinery and powers, sometimes the lack of them, of the European Parliament. Parliament plays a role reflecting public opinion, making sure the Commission is on track to follow certain negotiating guidelines and so we want to make sure we're having a full uh, conversation about what those guidelines should be. We do the same thing in Congress as we advise our president in those negotiations with our trade ambassador and we think that'll produce a better result. Mr. Paulson is also aware that key trade agreements have been rejected by Parliament before, like ACTA, the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement signed by several major economies but rejected by the EU after MEPs felt it eroded the rights of citizens. They want to make sure that they're responding to what their constituencies are telling them are important. And I think the system is a little similar to the United States where the parliamentarian, parliamentarians, you know, ultimately uh, they ultimately are trying to give some guidance to the commissioner. A new trade agreement with Europe will level the playing field for American companies. They do things differently in the States, no doubt about that. But they see more similarities than differences with the EU in the implementation of democracy. A lot of time with presidents. And that's important. <laughs> it brings the houses closer, gets them listening to each other. The European negotiations are going to have more support just because these are our best friends, our best allies, our values are the same. Uh, stronger bipartisan support. So I think there's going to be building excitement actually about these negotiations as time goes forward, knowing full well it's still going to take, you know, up to a year or thereabouts to make sure that it's done successfully. What next in the evolution of the European Parliament's powers? The 2009 Lisbon Treaty handed more of them to it, making the Commission and European Council less obscure bodies, managing legislation affecting 500 million citizens from behind closed doors. But any new powers would have to be made by a new EU treaty, and that's not on the horizon yet. The ganze Bereich der Außen- und Sicherheitspolitik, der ist natürlich noch nicht vergemeinschaftet und uh, da werden wir, glaube ich, weiter arbeiten müssen, aber es gibt da noch ein paar Politikbereiche, die noch nicht voll entwickelt sind. Aber insgesamt ist mit dem Lissabon-Vertrag natürlich eine große Kompetenzerweiterung des Parlaments gegeben und die muss auch äh, ordentlich ausgefüllt werden. In the case of ACTA, a really big wake-up call was sounded to the European Commission. Nevertheless, a tension in the division of power remains. Much still resides in the hands of member states, individually and collectively, acting through the European Council. Bis 2009 war sicherlich ähm, in der Kommission, aber auch in vielen Mitgliedstaaten die Meinung vorherrschend, internationale Abkommen sind auszuhandeln ohne Beteiligung des Parlaments. Und das hat sich fundamental geändert. Ich glaube, es ist in der Zeit heutzutage, dass Handelsverträge, andere Verträge unter Beteiligung der demokratisch gewählten Repräsentanten auszuhandeln sind. This then is the principal message. Power is a fluctuating thing, never still. It diminishes and increases through different epochs, as much in the United States as in Europe. And right now, here, say MEPs, it's changing gradually to their advantage. A Pont EU a Pannon Televízió Európai Uniós magazin műsorát látták. Egy hét múlva is várom önöket, viszontlátásra!